Well, hello, friends. Andy C. Luda here. And I want to welcome you to a very special time and episode in terms of my video blogs. I am so very, very excited because I have a special guest that I want to share with you today. This happens to be Women's History Month. We have just concluded the International Day of the Woman, and I'm coming to you on the behalf of our New Life School of Theology. This is a theology class that I hold and convene every month, actually twice a month, here on Long Island of New York. Uh, today I have a very special guest that I want to share with you. She recently uh, conducted a workshop for us that, we'll be talking, that we will be talking about in more detail in just a few moments. Uh, I want now to welcome Sister Naima Robinson to uh, your screen, and uh, we're going to talk to her and about her for the next few moments. Sister Robinson, how are you today? Thank you for being our guest today. Well, greetings to you and to your guests, to all of your viewers. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Now, Sister Robinson, you uh, shared with us this past week in our theology class, and we asked you to do a blending of women and then, of course, Black history. These are two areas that you are uh, extremely familiar with and that you have an expertise with. But before we go there, I do want to take just a uh, quick moment and talk to you about who Naima Robinson is. Give us a brief overview of your vitae, your uh, biography, and how you got to where you are today. Okay, well, thank you. I, I will start by saying that um, I come from two really dynamic and wonderful parents. Uh, my, my father, Judge Robinson, uh, and my mother, Dr. Pam, really raised me with an awareness of uh, my culture and an understanding that it's my responsibility to continue the struggle of my ancestors. So that means that they exposed me to all of the struggles that uh, people of color have gone through in the diaspora, all of the wonderful achievements we have accomplished, and that it's my job to continue that in that vein, to continue to fight for full equality and f full humanity in this system, and also to continue to make contributions um, for the next generation. And in pursuit of that, Sister Robinson, what has your academic journey, what has your scholastic journey consisted of these last several years? So I'm currently a uh, doctoral student at Long Island University, and I have been pursuing doctoral studies there since um, 2006. And I am in the concluding phases of that right now. I'm currently working with my uh, dissertation committee and uh, working, putting together my dissertation research, which is on the effects of parental incarceration on student achievement. I, uh, I currently hold two master's degrees. Uh, both of them are also from Long Island University, uh, one in education, one in school administration, and I hold a bachelor's degree in history from the uh, University of Buffalo. Yes. My parents are graduates of Howard University, and so to their great dismay, I did not attend <laughs> a historically black college university, even though I think that they are wonderful places. And that's actually where most of our scholarship um, has been over the last hundred years. But, and I'm, I still consider myself a scholar and an advocate in the community. And I'm an educator. I'm a teacher. I teach a high school class. I teach high school seniors in New York City. Excellent. Excellent. And in terms of civic involvement, you have quite a repertoire and quite a reputation in that particular area. You first came to my attention uh, a few years ago when you were the invited keynote speaker at the Martin Luther King annual event that took place at Bethel AME Church. It was rather intimidating because uh, Pastor Hayward called upon me to speak after you finished speaking. And you, of course, had wrecked the house so yeah. much. You know, I was so intimidated to get up and try and say yeah. anything in the wake of the wonderful message that you had given. But talk to us just a, a bit about your uh, civic involvement. 
So my involvement has mostly been with students because I've been a, a high school teacher since 2008. And I find that our students are so gifted and, and talented and hungry for knowledge, but also are in a system and a structure that's not really designed for their success. Unfortunately, right here on Long Island where uh, parents sacrifice to live and to buy homes and pay taxes and put their students in the local school district. Sometimes these school districts are just underserving our students. And I try to stand in the gap there. I'm actively involved in a community organization and we're working to supplement some of the um, education that our students receive. So we conduct after school programming weekly. We conduct Saturday school. We do SAT prep. In the summer, we do a summer program. And we are working um, right now to develop a full charter school that would be an alternative school setting for our students. So my activism has really been around you know, bringing up the next generation and training our students to continue to fight. And Sister Robinson, uh, before we jump to your presentation, which I'm rather anxious to do, uh, before we leave this, this dialogue that we're currently having, what you and I have in common, admittedly from different eras and different generations, we are both disciples and students of Dr. Ben Yosef Chikanin. Uh, during my days at Harvard, he was a, uh, not only a mentor, but he was the chief scholar that uh, I sought out, and it was his material that I used and got me in trouble. You know, one of his uh, featured books is African Origins of the Three Major Religions. I wrote a paper based upon his research, submitted it to my Old Testament professor, and nearly got thrown out of Harvard Divinity School. And the teacher <laughs> said to me, uh, I, am, I am giving you an F, not because what you said was not true, but because you had the courage and the boldness to write it and put it on a piece of paper. So we both have an affection for Dr. Ben Yosef Chikan. Talk to us about your introduction to Dr. Ben and your fellowship of him as a scholar even today. So my parents would take me to scholars like, like Dr. Ben um, and, and others, um, Leonard Jeffries and, and, and others to, to study and like learn at their feet. And that's where my education really began. So I have, uh, I grew up and, and developed, cultivated a deep appreciation for African civilizations before colonization, African spirituality and history, and all of our history going back long before our contact with Europeans and our experience in the Americas. And I think that Dr. Ben, especially with his introduction of the African origins of civilization, the African origins of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, that this to me is really the crux of our cultural values and where we get our values. So from a, from a teacher like Dr. Ben, I understand the values of goodness, the value of fighting for goodness, the value of justice as an African concept, and an African value of justice, uh, ma'at, or an African concept of love and, and family and community. I think that Dr. Ben established that as what our values are so that when I come into a room to I bring myself, I don't bring myself just for the color of my skin, but the values that I hold, which I believe I was taught by Dr. Ben and others. I, I've also studied with other African scholars um, from the diaspora. Uh, I, I would be, um, I would, I don't want to neglect to mention some of the names of the teachers because those teachers have been like master teachers to me. One of the best was a man named Master Nabo Malamusa Mori Denebeg, who was a Dogon priest. And just these, these teachers being able to help us to learn our culture, learn who we are and where we really come from, have instilled in me a sense of, of purpose and, and a drive to continue, to continue on. Excellent, excellent. Well, Sister Robinson, uh, last Saturday, you shared with us extensively uh, on the topic of women history. And I was struck by the fact that you said that while you have been invited to speak any number of times at Black history events, that this was the first time that you had been invited to speak at a women's history event. That really excited me, and I hope that uh, it proved 
to be beneficial and a learning experience even for you. So what I am going to do is uh, I'm going to share the presentation that you gave us and uh, walk us through that. Okay. And whenever you're ready, uh, I'm going to turn the microphone over to you so that you can share with us all that you had to say on last Saturday. Now, we, and I am doing this primarily because we had a number of students who, for a variety of reasons, were unavailable last Saturday. Okay. And of course, your presentation and your material is a part of their required curriculum. So I am recording this today so that I could put this in their hand. Normally, we do the Saturday session online and we're able to record the lecture online. But because you blessed us by being there in person, we did not have that option. So today is kind of a follow-up to last Saturday, and it allows me to uh, present to those students who were absent, for whatever the reason, an opportunity to hear your brilliance and your scholarship. So okay. we're in your hands. So now I want to ask a question. Uh, is your audience able to see me now, or are they just going to see the presentation? They're going to see the presentation, but they will see you off to the right. Oh, they will uh, be able to see. Yeah, there are two okay. boxes that that will continue to uh, show both of us. Okay, that's great. All righty. So I, I, it was the first time that I was ever asked to speak for Women's History, and at first I, I, I wasn't really sure if I was up to the task because it's something sometimes that is so personal because I, I'm a woman and I, I'm a daughter and I'm also a mother. And um, I'm close with my mother, my grandmother. We're all a very close family of women. So uh, actually I, I started this presentation with uh, thinking about Bell Hooks because you mentioned that you had been to Oberlin and she was a scholar at Oberlin. So this is Bell Hooks. And I wanted to start off by just saying that, you know, we have to really honor, honor women. It's, uh, we should, we do. I, I think that it's not necessary to say it, but I want to say it uh, almost an offering, um, uh, offering a prayer or a blessing for the women because women are the life force through which we've all come into existence. Uh, if, if anything, you know, you brought, you, you brought up Dr. Ben, so that just brings up a flood of other things. I'm also a member of ASCAT, the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations, and, and I've learned from many others um, in that organization that we as people of color and African people in the diaspora, we do honor women. It's been a part of our tradition um, from the beginning. So we honor women, we celebrate women, and in the Americas, we understand that there have been many obstacles and systems of oppression that are against us. But I wanted to just say that even though there are many stereotypes about black women, um, some of those stereotypes are, for example, that we're angry or that we're aggressive or that we're emasculating, but that, as I stated simply here, black women are magic. And I, I, I think that we already knew that, so I'm going to just move forward and go through some of the women that I think are important to, to point out. So Shirley Chisholm, I was thinking about Shirley Chisholm because we're in the political season and politics is ever present right now. I don't think I ever take my, chat, my television off of the cable news because the, the politics is, is so in our face and seems so important. And Shirley Chisholm, was a freedom fighter, was the first black woman to run for the presidential nomination in the United States in 1972. She was also the first uh, African-American woman in Congress. And she was the first to run for a, uh, a, the nomination of a major political party. Her, her political struggle was not without discrimination. She was discriminated against by the Democratic Party. She was barred from participating in the televised debates. However, she was able to still garner so much support, so much grassroots support. She was a woman from Brooklyn, and her motto was unbossed and unbought. 
she was just a dynamic, strong sister, but, but still a sensitive woman who was able to still go to her adversaries and show them love and kindness and respect. And she was able to garner 152 of the delegates in that nomination process in 1972. She got 10% of the votes. And even though her campaign was underfinanced and there was a lot of contentiousness, even um, on behalf of the Congressional Black Caucus, which was predominantly male, she really did make a dynamic splash. And she's sort of the predecessor for the women that we see um, running for office now and making a stand now in the government. So we stand on her shoulders. We just want to honor her. And you could go on to the next one. So Sister Lorraine Hansberry, I think on a personal level, I feel really like she's a very important person. But to understand that she's not, she was well known for being the writer of the famous play, A Raisin in the Sun, a beautiful play. And when I, I think about Black women as creative, as intellectual. She represents to me the peak of that. And yet her life was so short. She died at 34. And so that in and of itself is a tragedy. But she also represents to me the, the, the essence of the what's considered the threat of the black woman intellectual and artist. So an artist and an intellectual is not, a, is not a soldier, it's not a military person. And yet she was so threatening that the FBI was watching her, the FBI was, um, was listening to her phone calls and following her for a decade before she even wrote A, uh, a Raisin in the Sun. Um, she was in part of a circle of other artists and activists in New York City. She was friends with James Baldwin, and with Nina Simone, the three of them were like the three musketeers. And she um, had an untimely death at 34 due to pancreatic cancer, but she was also unaware of that cancer. And I think that that sort of bring home, brings home the tragedy of her life, said the doctors didn't tell her they thought it would be best if she didn't know. And so they told her she had ulcers and she wasn't even aware that she had this cancer. And there were other areas of her, where her life was in some ways restricted and she was unable to live the full potential of her life. But I still want to honor her as uh, a beautiful artist and intellectual. Angela Davis, to me, I was fortunate to meet her. I grew up with posters of free Angela Davis. And it's just, she represents to me the pinnacle of this revolutionary spirit that, that Black women have. Unafraid, unafraid to be herself, unafraid to fight against the system. She um, was first a philosophy professor uh, in the University of California and then was in, embroiled in um, a murder case that where, they, where she was charged with the murder for a case that, for, that, that the, the murder happened when she wasn't even there, but she was charged with providing the weapons that were used in the, in the murder. Um, and she, the, the, the case just got international attention. And she became a symbol internationally of the struggle of Black people for freedom in the 1970s. She was eventually acquitted in 1972. Um, and the, the, the case against her was extremely weak. And the, uh, there was obviously a political nature to the case that, the, that as a, um, she wasn't even a Black Panther, but because she was associated with the Soledad brothers and with other Black liberation activists, that there was such a huge um, government machine to destroy those movements. And she's one of the survivors of that movement. So we honor her and uh, honor that revolutionary Black woman spirit. So I think the, the, the obvious um, Michelle Obama, it, uh, uh, Michelle Obama represents everything that we want our mothers and our daughters to be. She was college, uh, Ivy League educated, just uh, polite and, and respectful and kind. She's intelligent, outspoken, very professional, the first lady of the United States, the first black first lady of the United States as the wife of Barack Obama. 
But what I think it's important to remember about Michelle Obama and, and about Barack Obama um, is that the backlash that the election of Barack Obama really brought and how that led us to where we are today in 2019 because uh, Michelle Obama really exposes the myth that if you're polite, if you're educated, if you're virtuous, if you're good, then all the fruits of America will open up to you. But in fact, uh, that's the white supremacist worst nightmare. And W.E.B. Du Bois said in Black Reconstruction that if there was one thing that, that South Carolina feared more than bad Negro government, it was good Negro government. So in essence, Black respectability, success, and excellence are far more frightening than the Black gangster or thug. And it is this Black excellence that creates cognitive dissonance. And dissonance is any fact or evidence that goes against what one believes to be true. The Black thug confirms that white supremacy, uh, what white supremacy holds to be true, but Michelle Obama presents a problem. Michelle and Barack Obama expose the lie and thus they must be destroyed. They must be made to fail and lies must be told about them. The Obamas were the best of us and when President Obama left office, a majority of the Republican party did not believe that he was a citizen. That's all I have to say about that. We can go to the next one. So I think uh, thinking about the struggle for political power that Black women have been taking on, uh, we find ourselves now with one of the top candidates for the Democratic Party nomination for president of the United States, uh, Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris is from Oakland, California. She went to Howard University. She graduated in 1986 with a degree in political science and economics. She got a law degree from the University of California, Hastings. And she was, um, she's been a, a strong advocate for, for women, for people of color, for marginalized people, for the incarcerated and the recently incarcerated. And she, I think, stands a really good chance of getting the nomination of the Democratic Party. And what that shows is not just the trajectory, the path that we've been on, but it also shows the time that we're in. And I think that we, we may very well be in the time where women um, can take political power. I see this slogan, the future is female. And I think that Kamala Harris being female is not a handicap. Um, in the way that it has been in the past. Of course, there's never been uh, a president, a female president of the United States. And there certainly has never been a black woman as president of the United States. But she certainly stands at a time where that's possible. And she represents the fact that the, uh, the future of the United States is looking for women leadership and women leadership uh, just like her. I also have inserted here a picture of her parents because it's really important to, to acknowledge where she comes from. She's the child of a Jamaican father uh, and an Indian mother, both immigrants to the United States, both um, educated and uh, very active in political government. She was also raised in a Baptist church and also pledged a, um, AKA a black sorority when she was at Howard University. So she's firmly uh, enmeshed in the black community. So you could go, the next thing that I really wanted to, to transition here and talk a little bit about what we don't talk about, because when I thought about being asked to, um, to, to uh, make this presentation for women's history, I really thought about what the reality is for, for black women and what it has been in the diaspora for the last four, nearly 500 years. So the reality of, of our experience has been fraught with much pain and grief. And that that pain and grief um, is the result of, of uh, generations of trauma and that's been untreated trauma. And so when we are really dealing with the reality of our, of our lives and our experiences, I think that I, since I have this opportunity, I want us to be able to 
take a look at the grief and the pain that black women are holding. So that uh, I'm just going to transition to talk a little bit about that. Um, one of the things I, I do, I do love, uh, my, my daughter always says, oh, I love sad songs, <laughs> but, um, and, and sometimes sad books. So this is a novel that's written by this beautiful woman here, Essie Ejiguan, and the novel is called Washington Black. It was uh, one of the top 10 books of the year in 2018. Um, it was the uh, finalist for the Man Booker Prize and really one of the best books of the year. And so it's a book about uh, a young man who grows up on a plantation in Barbados. He's enslaved and it follows him throughout his life after he leaves the plantation and lives the rest of his life as a free man. And um, so it's, it's important also, I find that sometimes some of these novels, movies, even songs touch that essence of the pain of our experience that I want to acknowledge. I want to acknowledge the pain that's been in our experience. And I don't want to gloss over that uh, any longer because we really do need to have a healing from the pain and we won't have that healing if we continue to, gro to gloss over it. So one of the things I point out about this book is a female character called Big Kit. And Big Kit is, um, she's presented in the, early in the book as like the caretaker of the young, the young Washington Black. And he describes her as just this fierce, mysterious woman. I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to read just a portion of his description of her. He says, in the smoldering fields, she would glisten as if oiled, tearing up the wretched earth, humming strange songs under her breath, her flesh rippling. I loved her voice, its rough music. She would suck air through her teeth and squint her eyes up and begin, and I would stop whatever task was at hand and stand listening in wonder, for she was a marvel, witness to a world I could not imagine, beyond the reach of the huts and the vicious fields of the plantation. So he's describing Big Kit, who had been born in Dahomey in Africa and was now enslaved on this plantation. So he knew that she had previously had an existence in another land that he didn't know because he had lived his whole young life uh, on this horrible plantation in Barbados. And as they're on the plantation, um, you, you see that it's really cruel. And there's a, there's a really cruel master there. And so uh, Big Kit plans to kill herself and Washington Black so that they can be reborn in their homeland. And she says, if you dead, you wake up in your homeland again, you wake up free. So just for a moment, I want to pause and just imagine the desperation of people who think that their only escape from their situation is suicide, as many Africans did, even throwing themselves when, when they were able to off of the ships, the, uh, the slave ships that were bringing them over to the Americas. So she, her plan to kill herself seems drastic, but yet it was, it was an idea that many of the slaves had. And so there had been like a rash of, of suicides on the plantation and the master organizes one of the dead slaves to be decapitated, to have his body removed, removed from his head in front of the whole community so that he understood that according to the beliefs of the people, you can't be reborn in your homeland without your head. And he tells them, I will do this to each and every new suicide. Mark me, none of you will ever see your countries again if you continue to kill yourselves. And Washington Black says he looked up at Big Kit and for the first time he saw in her face something he had never seen in it before, despair. Mm. Uh, so that spoke to me for so many reasons, but later, later on in this um, story, he, uh, to, he, he's able to go back to the plantation. Um, you know, uh, slavery at this time had ended and the plantation was being sold and he's able to go through the records. Big Kit is deceased. And he discovers through the records that Big Kit was his mother. And he, he hadn't known that. And I think that that 
also is another reality for many black women in the diaspora is this idea of losing your children or having your children taken away from you and also the perverse idea of love and what that meant on a slave plantation. So attachment on a slave plantation was in fact perverse. Uh, when you have someone you love on a slave plantation, how attached are you going to be? You have to, be, you have to equip yourself emotionally for the fact that one day they could be gone from you. So how much of your heart really are you going to let break? And it makes sense that I can't love you too much because I have to be okay if you are gone. And this is the duality of reality that no human being should have to deal with, and yet we're still dealing with it today. So some of the behaviors that we see with Black women and children, um, mothers and husbands and, and wives, um, can really be traced back to this perverse relationship where attachment is, is such a scary thing and where um, that fear of abandonment, because in fact, Washington Black, who was a really bright um, and gifted artist, um, is, that's discovered by the master and he is taken away and she never, does, she never does see him again. So she knew she had to prepare herself for that and so never was able to connect with him as her son and he grows up motherless and she's never able to really love him. I mean, that is, part of our story. So I just want to go to the next slide um, and talk about releasing our grief in a community. This is uh, one of the teachers that I admire very much. His name is Maladoma Somme, and he's from Burkina Faso, West Africa. And he talks about grief, and he does a, a grief ritual as a community ritual. And he talks about grief being felt at a time when something contradicts our very sense of humanity and separates us from our sense of identity. Any dramatic event creating a crisis of the soul that requires reconciliation. And that we in the Western world are conditioned to suppress and repress these powerful emotions. We hold a stiff upper lip through adversity and pain. And we've been told that time heals all wounds and that we can carry a heaviness of heart. But in his culture, in the West African tradition that he's from, the Dagara people, um, they actually vent grief. And there, and there is a ritual for venting grief. And it's seen as very necessary. And so he invites uh, people in, in the diaspora to participate in this ritual of releasing grief. Um, so just he, that holding back unexpressed emotion uh, and tears is like a time bomb, both dangerous to ourselves and the world around us, that emotions sit within our bodies on a cellular level and that our bodies require the freedom to flow, not just the physical flow of oxygen and nutrients and blood, but also energetically. And when a blockage remains, within a region of the body for extended periods, it impedes the natural flow becoming toxic and creates disharmony, imbalance of mind and disease of the body. So I offer that as one uh, explanation for why we have so much disease and disharmony in our own bodies and then as an extension of our bodies in the community because grief is a community problem where a person who is sick, in fact, belongs to the entire community and that sickness belongs to the entire community, just as um, a smile can, um, can liven up a room and uh, the grief can also affect the whole community. So I, I offer that as, uh, as just one path of healing, uh, this grief ritual. So we could go on there because I want to talk, um, really get, I, got, I really wanted to get into some of the the theory, I think that black women have presented in, in academia and in social uh, discourse. So the theories that I think black women have really contributed are looking at our psychology and our emotional health. And that's what women as a group, what we bring to the table, looking at the, the collective, how can we be healthy people? So um, this concept of intergenerational trauma uh, it's a trauma that happens when a group 
um, experience the trauma, but it's not resolved in one generation. And so when the trauma is ignored and there's no support, the trauma is passed on from one generation to the next. And this has been observed in sur the children of survivors of the Nazi Holocaust who seek treatment in clinics. Um, and this started in 1966. And then you could see the descendants and the grandchildren uh, experiencing this trauma. Now they were able to go and seek treatment. I don't believe that many of the descendants of the trauma that we've experienced in the slavery system, um, slavery and colonialism, that we've really sought the treatment that we uh, that we need. So we can go to the next one for that. So this is looking at historical trauma. And the historical trauma is all of the emotional and psychological wounding over a lifespan and across generations that has come from massive group trauma experiences. So we didn't just experience the Middle Passage, the horror of the Ma'afa, the horror of the slave plantation alone, that that was a collective trauma that we um, and that we accumulated wound after wound after wound so not just the kidnapping and the beating and the rape and the working and the and the being beaten on the plantations and working to death and having our children sold away from us etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, and then progressing on to the lynchings and the the trauma of the KKK um, and white supremacists but um, this trauma has been collective so if you go to the next slide I'm just looking at the different points um, of trauma and this I'll stop right here this um, concept is really flushed out by a by a woman named Dr. Joy DeGruy and Dr. Dr. Joy DeGruy is a psychologist um, a social worker she grew up in LA and she's in Portland right now and her work is called post-traumatic slave syndrome and she describes it as a condition that exists as a consequence of centuries of chattel slavery followed by institutionalized racism and oppression, and how that has resulted um, in the experiences that we, uh, the adaptive behaviors that we have right now, uh, the post-traumatic slave syndrome. So if you go to the next slide, I will just briefly, briefly talk about the five points of trauma that are here. So we are familiar with the, the chattel slavery system, chattel meaning that we are considered animals, uh, not fully human. And the, uh, the whole system of uh, American chattel slavery is based on the concept that black people are not human, do not feel pain, do not feel grief, do not need sleep, uh, and all of the um, other rather convenient myths that made us ideal for slavery in the eyes of white supremacy. Uh, and then we go from that to the Jim Crow South, um, the 100 years of lynching, that's fleshed out in the in the book that I brought to the class, A Hundred Years of Lynching, um, and then in, in visual in the um, Without Sanctuary. And um, this overflows into the migration, the Great Migration, which, you know, it was not easy to get out, but it was the largest migration of any, any group of people within one country when all of our ancestors left the South and went North, um, and then encountered Again, a re-traumatization of the, the ghettos in the North, the uh, segregation that we experience in the North, the, the employment discrimination, the violence of the police, and all of the uh, experiences uh, were re-traumatized over. And that just continues into the 60s and 70s, um, and then into what we have today with mass incarceration, drugs, the trauma of the, uh, the criminal justice system, and uh, the trauma of police brutality, and the trauma of, the, of welfare and ghettos, and, uh, and so on. So you see all of these points of trauma, multi-generational trauma that we've experienced together. If you go to the next slide, we're going to take just another... Um, a brief, a brief um, foray into modern times when we're talking about the trauma. This is um, Governor Ralph Northam, who is the governor of Virginia. And uh, you might remember about two or three weeks ago, uh, he was all over the news because it was a surprise to everyone, uh, even to him apparently, that he was uh, in blackface in his um, medical school 
uh, yearbook uh, next to someone that was in the Ku Klux Klan robe. So, you know, that's traumatic. That re that re injures us when we see those images. Remembering the minstrel, remembering the the the, uh, the blackface, the Jim Crow, the Ku Klux Klan, and so. In the wake of that, him and his wife um, decide they're going to do some healing work. And so his wife is um, giving a tour of a, the, uh, the governor's mansion in Virginia, which is one of the oldest um, governor's mansions in the country, uh, built by slaves, as much, much of the country was built by enslaved labor. And as she's giving this tour to black students, she gives uh, the black students some cotton to hold and asks them to imagine what it would be like to be a slave picking cotton. And so that just brings us back because this is very, very, very current. Um, that was just last week. And uh, it brings us back to the trauma and how we experience that and how that still wounds us to today because we have never really healed from this trauma and how we're still um, very fragile as a result and how there's a lack of sensitivity and awareness about it. So we could go to the next one because um, all of this is really available in um, Dr. Joy DeGruy's book, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. She's, I think, now well known, and I think her theory is also being um, more widely accepted um, because there are obviously some adaptive behaviors that we have that are um, unhealthy. Uh, we, ha we have some adaptive behaviors that um, bring resilience and are productive, but we have some adaptive behaviors that are quite unhealthy. And she really brings out some of those. Um, I think it's on the next slide where I flushed out what some of those adaptive behaviors are. I think they're important that we identify them so that we know them when, they see, when we see them. So vacant esteem, um, that I, I think that the best way to describe vacant esteem is sort of um, like not a, a hatred for the self, a self-hatred, um, a believing in, in the myth of our inferiority, um, a dislike. You can see it when you hear people say things like, oh, so-and-so is too dark, or even calling someone black as an insult. Um, this vacant esteem that being black is bad um, and that we are some in some way cursed. Um, and most black people in the diaspora, whatever generation you're in, experience that at some point, um, the not wanting to be yourself, the, the, the and, and also that can lead to destructive behaviors. The uh, marked propensity for anger and violence, we see that often violence against the self, which is uh, usually our first go-to, uh, violence in relationships, um, which we talk about domestic violence, and also in with friends and relatives and acquaintances. But the one that I think for me brings it home the most is uh, the internalized racism. So internalized racism is the socialization process that we all go through in America, right? And that socialization process is part of our racist um, socializing, our racist upbringing. So identifying members of our own uh, ethnic group or our own cultural group um, negatively, having an aversion towards black people. Oh, I don't like black people. I don't want to be around black people. I don't want to go to that school. There's too many black people. I don't want to go to that store. It's too many black people. That's a part of the post-traumatic slave syndrome. Also the uh, aversion, antipathy, um, hatred towards our own customs and mores. So um, not liking our hair, not liking our skin, not liking our nose, our features, not liking when we see it on ourselves or when we see it in others, um, not wanting to talk about black history, not wanting to talk about our um, or Africa, not wanting to be called or identified African, you know, all of these things. And being African in the Americas sort of um, implies mixture, but then identifying more with the mixture than we do with the black. You know, uh, I re remember in 2000 being a census taker and it takes us like hours to do the census form because we're like, well, I, you know, I got a, I think I got a white relative somewhere. All, all of that is like our antipathy for our own um, culture and our own physical characteristics. So we could go to the next one. I don't want to um, talk too much. <laughs> so <laughs> This is the thing that I think uh, is the one that for me really explained it all. And if you don't know her yet, her name is Dr. Frances Cress Welsing. Her um, seminal work is the ISIS paper. She's incomparable um, uh, and without, with, the, you know, no, you can't really, no one can really um, hold a candle to her. 
in her analysis of racism and white supremacy. And so I, I like to bring her up because this is women's history. I want to bring up all of these women scholars and, and, um, and they get left out sometimes when we talk about our, the men. But Dr. Frances Cress Welsing, she, she lays it out. And I think if you go to the next slide, I might have some information on the next slide that will help me get through that. So we're talking about the reasons for the racism, white supremacy, which she describes um, is, is a system. Um, Neely Fuller, one of her teachers, really writes it out um, that racism, white supremacy is a system that it affects all areas of our lives, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. And that this system is, is set up in a way to protect um, uh, white supremacy so that they are the dominant group of people on the planet and that there's a reason. Uh, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing explains why they do that, right? That it's not just because they don't like the way we look, because that's actually not it. It's not because we're not good enough, because we actually are really way too good at everything, and that I'm sure pisses them off the most. But what, um, what she really lays out is that the reason is that this fear of genetic uh, annihilation, that white people as a minority on the earth are also genetically uh, recessive, the gene is genetically recessive, that they are a small minority of people on the earth while people of color are nine tenths of uh, the majority of people on the planet are people of color and that as white people explored the planet they discovered that they were the minority and so this need to control um people of color is actually um a need for gen to protect white genetic survival um to prevent intermarriage and intermingling um, to prevent the elimination of white people as a group, as a minority group on the planet. Um, so recognizing that white plus black equals, equals colored, white plus brown equals colored, and white plus yellow equals colored. So that when you um, are mixing with that black, um, black people have a, uh, that melanin, which is pigment, which is genetically dominant, right? So when you have a mixture of that gen genetically dominant gene, uh, is powerful, and that that really is the threat. It's a it's a it's a um, a threat to white genetic survival. So we see that sort of make sense as a as a basic motivation for white supremacy and racism. And I think we need to understand that and explain that to our children so that they understand that there is a, there is a, a a reason, and it does make sense, and um, that they're that. Uh, they're doing what makes sense to them, and we have to do what makes sense for us to combat that system. So if you just go to the next one, because I don't, I couldn't do a, a good, uh, as clearly, nearly as good a job as Dr. Francis Cress Welsing in explaining that system, but I could, I just want to explain a little bit of how it affects black women, right? Because the system of um, racism, white supremacy affects black women and black men, but it affects us both somewhat differently. So uh, when you're looking at this fear of genetic annihilation, this fear of the uh, dominant black um, genes and uh, the, the difference between that recessive gene and the, and the um, dominant gene, we're also looking at sexual violence because it becomes then at that point, it becomes an obsession with um, sexuality and reproduction. So one of the things that we know black women experienced in, in the, um, this experiment of America and the Americas, the, um, the European colonization of the Americas, uh, sexual violence started from, 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 the, from the beginning. So we have, um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with this story of Recy Taylor. Uh, there's a book about it called The Dark End of the Street. There's also a documentary now that's on stars called The Rape of Reese D. Taylor. And uh, without getting into the gruesome details, I will just give you a brief overview. So Reese Taylor was a young mother coming home from a church revival um, and walking down the street uh, on an, in an Alabama um, town with two other people, um, a man and a child. And um, she was kidnapped by a group of white men and uh, brutally raped. And uh, 
they knew who the men were because it was a small town, but there were no arrests made. And so the NAACP in Montgomery, Alabama, became aware of this and sent their lead investigator, who uh, was Rosa Parks. And that's why you see Rosa Parks' picture there. So Rosa Parks really goes to investigate this. And this, as part of our story as Black women, is important because it's not just the violence against us, against our bodies, but it's also the fact that we fight, we've always been fighting this violence. And so Rosa Parks was there um, on behalf of the NAACP and for years working on this case, trying to get justice for Reese Taylor and other black women in Alabama. And this is 10 years before the Montgomery bus boycott. This is while Martin Luther King is still in high school. And so black women are always actively involved in our own fight and our own struggle, not just as victims, um, because I don't want to paste, uh, paint Reese Taylor as just a victim. She is still alive to this day and is a strong, beautiful woman. And, but, and, we, and we are, and, and the survivor. But I think that um, I also want to point out that women like Rosa Parks are not this, um, this stereotype. Um, you know, she was just tired and didn't want to get off, give her bus seat up to a white man, but are fighters and are fighting for our own dignity and our own respect. Because in essence, the story of Reese Taylor is not unusual. There are hundreds of stories of, like this. There are, many of them are in the book at the dark end of the street. But what um, Rosa Parks represents here is that um, we have always been willing to, um, to, to get up from that and do the work that we have to do to continue to fight for our dignity because we've never really been respected. You know, she, there was, she had no, there, she got no respect. And yet we create for ourselves a way of respecting ourselves. We created words like my dear and big mama to show that we have respect for you and that we, that, you know, we love our women and that, um, you know, we're noble to represent our nobility. And so um, I wanted to point that out with this particular piece here. Um, the last thing, if you go to the next slide, is that we're also talking about the lynching and Dr. Francis Crest Wellsling points out that after the lynching, one of the first things that happens is a castration. And that uh, is symbolic on many levels, um, but it all, it's symbolic also of the preoccupation with sexuality. So when, when you have our experience with white supremacy, our experience in enslavement and, and all of the, uh, residual effects of enslavement is that they they have really been like focused on our sexuality um focused on uh black men and black male um genitalia from the first time they stepped off the ship there's been so much attention on that focused on black women and our bodies and so our bodies have never really belonged to us and that's a part of our tra of our trauma uh i quote juno diaz who's a um afro-dominican writer and he says, he writes about the intergenerational harm that systemic sexual violence has inflicted on African diasporic communities. And that really hits it home because we're talking about the systemic sexual violence, how this violence against black men and black women, you could see Emmett Till here. You can also see some of them, um, just a, 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 some of the lynchings because we're talking about a hundred years of lynching. Um, and also uh, the women who are here being lynched. And so you can see that um, we're talking about systemic sexual violence and how it's inflicted uh, harm on us intergenerationally. So we're still carrying that today. And there are some adaptive behaviors that we have developed in our community that are really unhealthy, that are a direct result of this harm to us that we um, have denied and not really been able to talk about or heal, heal from. So if you go to the next slide, um, it, this is Malcolm X saying that um, black women are the most disrespected, the most unprotected and the most neglected people in America. And in fact, there is a connection between the dehumanization of black men and black women during slavery and our relationships with each other today. So when we're looking at how black men and black women both fight really the same system in the same society um, and how we're both injured by the system, 
how it affects our relationship with each other because our first impulse is to punish each other for this violence. And so I cannot talk about black women without talking about our relationships with black men. And I'm gonna do that, but I'm gonna put the light on because I think it's getting dark. So let's see. Okay. Okay. So let's go to the next one and I'm going to see where that takes me. So, okay, so this is, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Sankofa, which is uh, a movie. And there's a scene in the movie where this young couple here, uh, the woman is eight months pregnant and they decide they're going to run away so that their child won't be, their baby won't be born enslaved. Unfortunately, they are caught by the overseers and they're brought back to the plantation. And um, uh, to make a lesson of them, uh, the master calls all the slaves together and they are going to beat her. Now she's eight months pregnant. But they ask the black overseer to beat her. And he beats her to death. Now, this is someone that he loved, that was like a sister to him, and yet he beats her to death. And then the medicine woman goes in, and she delivers the baby, because the baby's almost term. And she takes the baby, and in the next scene, you can see she's rocking the baby. And the man that beat her to death comes by, because they're all still there on the same plantation, working side by side together, and they have to continue to go on and exist like this, even after what what he's done. And... So the man comes by and he says, is the baby all right? You know, is that baby okay? And the medicine woman says, you know, the baby's going to be all right, but you can't come around for a while. And I want you to think about that man, right? The man who beats this girl to death. Now he has to go back to living with um, the women, the, the, the other people on the plantation. Um, he has to look at the, in the eyes of these other people who loved this woman and they they actually have to heal from this and so you know the question is like how how do you do that how do you do such a thing like how do you heal from that when they all understood that he did what he had to do because you could see that he had the gun trained on him and he had no choice and yet he still beat her to death and that was still their sister and their wife and you know this is her baby and so really how do they heal from that and how is he able to allow them to love him still how can he even accept love from them and you know how can they move on from that and it's so the systemic violence the beatings were done in such a way where it wasn't the white overseers that beat her it was the black overseer that beat her so we have to think about what that does to our relationships with each other and what that does to the human spirit. And we're going to go to the next one, but I just want to understand that what it does is it makes it difficult for us to look at each other. It makes it difficult for us to look at each other. It makes it difficult for us to see each other, and that makes it difficult for us to respect each other. So when we're dealing with all of these issues, we have to remember where that comes from. So this woman, one of my favorites um, in history, is Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer was a dynamic woman who lived almost all of her life on a plantation as a sharecropper until she was like 44. She had never left a plantation. Um, But in 1962, she decided to register to vote. So these are just some pictures of Fannie Lou Hamer, if you're not familiar with her, um, and some of her quotes. Um, I love this one right here. Whether you have a PhD or no D, (laughs) we're in this bag together. And whether you're from Morehouse or no house, we're still in this bag together. And she's from Mississippi and she was such a grassroots fighter. And if she doesn't give me inspiration as a black woman in in America fighting for our dignity, you know, I don't know where else to look. Like she definitely gives that sense of dignity and that sense of survival because her life for 44 years on a plantation was not good, but she still had the, the spirit in her to be a fighter. And if you go to the next slide, I'm just going to briefly talk a little bit about what happened to her. So famously, uh, when she went to vote in 1962, um, The next day she was kicked off of the plantation where she lived and worked for 18 years. She was married to another sharecropper um, and they were both, and their children were both kicked off the plantation. Um, 
And then she was arrested. And when she was arrested, she was uh, held in a cell where um, there were 17 others that were, uh, had gone to vote and they were all in different prison cells. And she can hear another woman being beaten in the cell next to her, right? She can hear the screams. Um, she can hear the woman yelling out and praying to God to have mercy on her. And then three uh, policemen come into her cell and they tell her they're going to make her wish that she was dead. And so they take her into another cell where there are two black prisoners, two male prisoners there. And again, they don't beat her, but they order the black male slave, um, excuse me, it's not much different, but prisoner, don't forget your 13th Amendment. <laughs> so they... Um, and they, they, they make the prisoner beat her. And so he gets this blackjack and um, under orders of the police, he beats her. And he beats her until he is exhausted. She says her body was stiff like metal. And when he's exhausted and he can't beat her any longer, they give the blackjack to the other prisoner and they order him to beat her. So they continue beating this woman and it makes you wonder, I mean, is she not a woman? Why, why are they beating her like a horse, like an animal? Even worse, would they even treat an animal that way? Um, and, you know, they didn't beat her to death, but she still had injuries from that beating for the rest of her life. But it, it's not much different from the story that was in the Sankofa movie. And that's, that's a real reality that it wasn't um, the white man who would do those beatings. Many times it was that they would have a black man do that beating. And so um, when she told this story, she gave this testimony, it's, it's recorded um, and you can get the whole transcript of her testimony. You know, it made many people cry. She brought many people to tears. But that is something that we're still dealing with. And that was, that's the reality, is that they used these uh, men who had no choice. So then the men are emasculated because they are not able to say no to that beating. They have to be the, the hand of violence, even though they, um, they have no choice. But, so they're emasculated in that way. And how this really affects systemically the relationship between black men and black women. So I think I'm going to go to the next one. Um, and just want to talk a little bit about the experience of black men and black women in slavery and how it really traumatized us both and how we are still dealing with that today. And so the trauma is not pretty and I'm not going to going to sugarcoat it, but I just want to give you a scenario. Okay. So first, when you have um, a, a man and a woman enslaved, right, they are considered the property of the master, right? They belong to the master. So even when the man has a wife, that wife is still the property of the master. And so when you take a woman out of a man's bed, and that is his wife, and then you rape her, right? And then you pass her around to some of your friends and maybe even their children. And then you say to him, before you leave with her, she, she better be good or I'm going to beat you. Now, I don't really know how you could destroy a man any further than that, right? So we're looking at the destruction and the subjugation of Black men and Black women in that instance, right? But also the destruction of the relationship between the two, because when she goes away and then she comes back, she has to do two things as a woman. She has to take care of herself, but she also has to take care of him. And as a man, as, his, as, as her husband, he now has to wonder, did, did she enjoy that? Um, could she have fought them off? Even though deep inside, he knows that she couldn't. And she has to look at him and wonder, well, why, why couldn't you protect me? Why couldn't you stop this from happening to me? And then at the same time, she doesn't want him to feel any guilt or shame. And she certainly doesn't want him to feel any disgust of her. So they're both having to deal with those unspoken things. And they, they have to exist like that perpetually. And when they wake up the next morning, they're not the same people. But to understand the psychology of that, that's what the post-traumatic slave syndrome, Dr. Joy DeGruz's theory really helps us to understand the psychology of that. And um, not to mention the fact that their children are watching and how this 
pathology gets passed on from generation to generation. So what is the psychology of that rape? It's not simply about the rape. That is to make certain that she's submissive, one, but also to make certain that she knows fully that he could not protect her. That's the psychology. I think it might have been effective because we're still dealing with that today. So if you go to the next, I just want to say a little bit about where we are today, because the emasculation of the black male um, and the soiling of the black woman still moves throughout history. And what happens is that we have become a reminder of our weakness. The black man looks at the black woman and it's a reminder of failure. And he says, show me something else, right? I don't want to look at this anymore. I don't want to, to, to look in the eyes and see all of the failure and be reminded of that. And the, we have a couple, let's say today, they're integrated. Everyone's got their degree. They got their down payment on the house. They're doing great. And they think they're going to have this American dream until they find themselves living paycheck to paycheck, right? And they're still dealing with racism, white supremacy. They're still dealing with this system. And so they look at each other. And the black woman still says, well, why can't you protect me? Why can't you give me, uh, why can't you be that over there, what I've been told you're supposed to be? And he absolutely is going to look at her and say, you know, he wants someone that's not going to question that. And so this becomes the problem that we're dealing with even today. They're looking at each other and they're saying, why can't you be the other? Okay, because we've been told that we're, we were on the, that we're on the come up, that slavery is over and we're free. And we really bought it that we're supposed to have the house and the two cars and the garage and the yard and the whole, the whole spread, right? We've really bought that. And then when we don't have it, we're punishing each other for it. Instead of looking at the system uh, and the trauma that's preventing us from having those healthy relationships. So what we have instead is a system where black people want their children to pick someone else I hear it all the time, I'm sure not any of you, but I hear it all the time, where we want our children to pick someone else because we want out of the race, where we are fleeing from each other, where we don't want to look at um, our black face any longer or your black face any longer. Uh, we don't believe that we're beautiful, and uh, even though we are, but don't believe it until white people tell us that we are. And um, are dealing with all of those, those um, adaptive behaviors that are part of the post-traumatic slave syndrome. So that's where we come to today, a place where we remind each other of the trauma that we've been denying for generations. So I just want to leave with that part there for us to think about how we can heal from that and how the healing happens when we're willing to, to love ourselves beyond how much we've hated ourselves. So, and I'm going to end with this last piece of um, uh, just about how we still carry the injuries of our mothers and our fathers, not to forget that, that we carry the injury of our mothers and our fathers. Okay, I'll, well, third time, we carry the injury of our mothers and our fathers and the healing begins with us. So, um, Hopefully on a lighter note, we have um, Fannie Lou Hamer, who went to Africa, started Freedom Farms to help Black people buy farms, grow food in the South, in Mississippi. She stayed in her town of Rueville, Mississippi, died on land that she owned. And every time she got a check or went somewhere on, on North, she would give money to uh, other Black families to buy their land, uh, understanding that it was about us being sustainable and helping each other. So she really kept it grant, grassroots and really kept it uh, to the land and believed that we had to have our own, um, that we had to have our own. So um, she, I believe, is a success story and a triumph. Next, we have... Um, Angela Davis, who's another success, that this sister survived the horrible abuse of the state trying to imprison her. And today she's a professor emeritus at the University of California. That Asada Shakur, who had the state trying to kill her in so many ways, um, had her imprisoned, um, 
had shot her, had her accused of charges from bank robbery to murdering a police officer, all of which were trumped up and untrue. But today she's alive and free in Cuba. And I mean, that, those two sisters right there, just to look at their faces represents that how strong we are and what survivors we are, that these women are alive and free, uh, in spite the fact that the system tried to kill them both. And um, next we have um, the uh, beautiful and comparable Michelle Obama, whose book Becoming uh, was the best selling hardcover book of 2018. I'm sure you all have it, give it to your daughters. And she even talked about how she just never felt like she was good enough. And I mean, if she's not good enough, then who is? She's the best. And we all, we, we all are, we love Barack because of her. <laughs> Yeah, we love Barack Obama because of Michelle. So we love her and we just, she, she definitely is good enough. And the fact that she went her whole life not thinking that she was just says a lot about how that post-traumatic slave syndrome still impacts us today. And the last thing that I have to share is that Kamala Harris is running for president of the United States of America. And that lets us know where we are, what we are capable of, our potential, the strength of all these women and of all that we've been through is, is in us. And that strength just makes us better, makes us stronger. And if we can heal from all of the pain and the grief, uh, if we can let it all go, we can continue to make progress and um, the sky is the limit. So that was all, that was my presentation and that's pretty much all that I have. I hope I, tried to fit so much into it, but I hope that um, it was useful. Well, Sister Robinson, you have done an outstanding job, and we are so thoroughly impressed, and uh, you, have con you have converted us to become admirers of yours. I described you and, and introduced you as one of the bright academic and scholastic stars that we have on the horizon. I am first in line. When your dissertation becomes a book, yeah. I am first in line to receive a uh, handwritten audiograph copy of your work. Uh, we are so proud of you and to know that you come from our section of Long Island. It makes all of us who live here so godly proud of uh, what you have become and how you speak truth to power and how you have developed into this icon of a uh, uh, academic uh, here on Long Island. So thank you so very much for thank taking you so time much. <laughs> to be with us uh, today. Just, just a quick question or two, if I can. Of course. Uh, so Sister Robinson, um, talk to us about some of the clumsy behavior that has emerged in our community between males and females as a result of this PTSS. I know you alluded to it in somewhat of a generic form, but be a little more specific and talk to us. What are some of the characteristics that we see in male and female behavior, African-American male and female behavior, that is a direct result of PTSS and seemingly our ability to make the most and to optimize our relationships with each other because there seems to be these hidden uh, factors of sabotage mm -hmm. that makes our communication and our community difficult. So I think that um, one of the things I've learned from Dr. Joy DeGruy is that the, uh, the pathology is really the denial, right? So the fact that we have this denial of our own fragility, our own vulnerability, that we want to, you know, we, we act like everything's on the up and up and, you know, and we, and we don't have any pain, which is why when given this opportunity, you know, I always like to think about where I am personally. And so maybe that will resonate with others because we need to acknowledge that we're fragile, that we're all fragile. So that if I'm in a relationship with the man, you know, that I'm not saying, you know, you know, why can't we, you know, have 
that, you know, that house over there or that car that I see, you know, you're the man, you're supposed to give me that. And then not be able to hear that he's dealing with something at work or, or frustrated that he's got to deal with racism at his job or afraid that, you know, he might not have, um, you know, the money to make something happen. That we don't want to hear that because we don't want to acknowledge that we're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. and that we're fragile and then the fear that if we do acknowledge that then we're going to beat each other up with it and that goes both ways so the first thing i think we need to do is acknowledge that that we're fragile um acknowledge that we need a tremendous amount that we need to be able to be vulnerable and and love each other through that so i think that that's also really important and then another piece that i wanted to to sort of at least allude to and open up the conversation is um, this re-injuring that we do of each other. So the, the re-injuring happens, um, first of all, we fight in different ways. Men and women fight in different ways. So women fight with their mouths and we can say things that can cut you and hurt you worse than a sword, right? Because you can, you can heal from a physical wound, but sometimes that those words, you can't heal from that. So we re-injure each other with wounds because you can still remember something someone said to you that hurt you and still bring it up right now and bring up those feelings. So those stay with us. And, uh, and then we pass that on to our children because they see us interacting with each other that way. But with the men, we, we also deal with the physical violence. And because women, Black women, our bodies have always been... Um, you know, the, the, the site of a violent assault, um, we continue to, to, be, to re-assault and to be victimized. And so that happens far too often and we don't talk about it as often. And then I think there's the pathology of the sexual uh, violence that goes on in our communities that b women are talking about more now I feel comfortable saying it because it's Women's History Month, so I might as well say it. But, but a lot of Black women have been talking about uh, being victims of survivors of sexual assault, violence, rape. And um, I mean, there's a one book out by a woman named Roxanne Gay. It's an, editor, it's an edited edition called Not That Bad, which are stories of Black women surviving sexual assault. And so we, we really have to take a look at that also and stop re-injuring ourselves and our children, the next generation, in that way. And those are horrible things, but they're all directly results from, from the slave syndrome. So that, that re-assaulting of ourselves in that way um, is, I believe, a direct result of post-traumatic slave syndrome. And just about everything, we, everything that we see, that we do, that we say, that's crazy, it's a real... <laughs> And I, I see it a lot because I'm with a lot of young people. And so I hear their unfiltered conversations and the language that they use to call each, the names that they call each other. And it's still there. It's definitely there. And since Robinson said you're talking about young people, you know, one of my particular favorite periods of Black history is Harlem Renaissance. And uh, I kind of brought that up when you were with us on Saturday, and I asked you the question about the comparison of these different cycles of history and the episodes of history that we've had in our community over the last 150 years. And I asked you what you thought it was going to take in terms of the next expression of uh, civil rights. And one of the things that you talked about was how inclusive you anticipated the future of civic activism might be. Can you talk a bit about that as a closing gesture and a, a closing note of our conversation today? So I will say, I mean, I, um, you know, I, my generation and then all of the, the young people that are coming up now are definitely in a cycle. So you talk about that cycle, the creative expression and political action, and that cycle is definitely working. So I'll give you an example from the, from the, um, the death of Trayvon Martin, and Michael Brown, and then um, all of the, the activism that happened around that, right? And so the activism that happened around that, obviously from, from Ferguson, Missouri, 
and uh, that was 2015. And then the Black Lives Matter movement, right? So this began a cycle of activism, right? Which we saw then it went to Baltimore and that cycle of activism has continued. Even though the FBI is definitely surveillancing, um, you know, you have black identity extremists as a designation now by the FBI. But all of uh, this activism has really continued. And so I follow and I pay attention and I read all of the things that are coming out of this group of, of young activists. And so what I have found most, um, what, what I think identifies and separates them from the previous generation of activists is that they are extremely inclusive. And so the movement right now is inclusive of LGBTQ identity, um, which they prefer, most prefer to just be called Q or queer. Um, and uh, women and that, that Me Too movement and the women's uh, or feminist, black feminism, and, and then the, the, what you would consider your traditional black um, lives matter or civil rights activism. So there's an inclusiveness. Now the difference, however, is that your previous generation of activists were predominantly male and definitely not that inclusive and predominantly came out of the church. I think that the church is still vital in our community, but because the church hasn't been as inclusive and certainly hasn't been as feminist or gay friendly, um, those, act, those movements are happening other places. And, but they are still definitely happening. They are just more inclusive now. And, and young people that are, in that fight right now are not going to wait for us to finally be like okay with feminism and okay with lg with gay rights they just are going to move around us and if we stand in the way they're just going to circumvent because the they see the unity in this movement and how important it is to work together so there is actually a large contingent of um openly queer black activism that there was always that they had rustin um yeah. james baldwin even in the harlem renaissance you can go back yeah. but it wasn't open okay so now there is a more open um you know black queer activism and there is certainly a more um a more um I guess, comfortable black feminist movement. And that's always been there too. You know, I didn't talk about Audre Lorde. I didn't talk a little bit, I mentioned in the beginning bell hooks, but that's always been there, but that um, has also been less apologetic. So they're, they, you, even one of the slogans I see all the time is unapologetic, not apologizing for being feminist, not apologizing for being queer, or not apologizing for being black. And those three things are coming together. So I know that might not sit well with everyone in our audience, but you asked. Okay. <laughs> and, and since we're on that note, let me, and I, I, I feel that I would be somewhat derelict in yeah. terms of my own journalistic responsibility if I did not give you an opportunity to define and contrast the difference between uh, feminist and womanist, because that is a very active conversation that's sure. going on in our community. So I think that that's a choice that, that people might make to identify themselves. Alice Walker first called herself a, a womanist, you know, but I, I, and I, and I read many uh, black um, women scholars, you know, Brittany Cooper, Catherine Carruthers, all these other women that are writing about their identity as black uh, feminists. Currently, these are young women in their 20s and 30s. And I think that I hear kind of both terms being used, but um, Alice Walker identified a womanist as a black woman who, you know, is fighting for not just herself, um, but also her family and her community. So it's not just about fighting for women's rights, but also fighting for the black family, fighting for, you know, black children, fighting for black sons so that they're not killed by the police, you know, fighting for the whole of it. And I think that in essence is where we are. Um, however, I think that this generation right now is invested in the idea of letting people identify themselves how they wish. And so I, I hear both terms used, you know, and, um, People are really, are, are this, this young generation is really invested on being able to, you know, have the self-determination to name themselves. And so they, they might use womanist or feminist um, equally. But I don't think, I, I, you know, I don't think that it means, if we'll 
black woman says she's a feminist, I don't think that that means that she's not identifying with those same concepts as, um, as a womanist, but sometimes they may choose the term, you know, to, um, to show like a general historical kind of vein of women's rights. But, but mostly black women have used the term womanist. Well, friends, for the last several, several, several minutes, you've been watching and listening to uh, Sister Naima Robinson. She's talking about uh, <laughs> black women history, women history, black history, uh, kind of putting those two things together. This has been an exciting time. I want to thank you so very, very much, Sister Robinson, for taking this time to redo what you did on Saturday, making it available in digital form so that we can share it with those uh, who are unavailable this past Saturday. Thank you for your time. We anticipate and expect, let me say, we both anticipate and expect great things from you. You are uh, some of the best of what we have to offer in the future, and we look to you to be an example, to be a mentor, uh, to be not only a product of our community, but a directional sign that will point the way uh, that we ought to go in the days to come. Friends, I am Andy C. Luda. I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank Sister Robinson for her time and remind you that uh, we're here and that we hope that you take advantage not only of this experience, but other experiences like this that we have available for you. God bless. Thank you.